Yeah, good morning. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Chong Kwang Yang Chong. Uh, I'm a structural engineer from Dongyang. Uh, today we have uh, four presenters, but uh, unfortunately, uh, number three, uh, Professor Marjorie Ellie Mary uh, will not absent here. So we have time to present. So, uh, but uh, we so, so, some rate restarts, so we will keep the time. So uh, you will introduce first present. Okay. Our first speaker is Mr. Ron Klimensik. And uh, the title of presentation, presentation is Architecture and Engineering as One. Mr. Ron is president of Magnuson Kilimanjik Association, a civil engineering firm headquartered in Seattle with offices in Chicago and Riyadh. Mr. Ron is involved with several professional committees, including the American Concrete Institute, the Structure, uh, Structure Engineering Association of Washington and Illinois, and the CTBUH, for which he was chairman from 2001 to 2006. Please welcome Mr. Ron. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to this session. Uh, the topic that I'm going to talk about is architecture and engineering as one. And uh, I'm really just going to start with the punchline. And it's really the essence of my entire talk. And that is that it's my firm belief and, in fact, my experience that the best buildings and the best architecture and the best engineering come when the engineer starts to play architect and the architect in turn starts to play engineer. And that we understand each other's language and we understand each other's intentions and hopes uh, in the design and we help each other realize this. And of course this is all done in the context of the client's brief or the client's goal for the financial uh, machine that they're creating in the form of the building uh, or the, the particular facility they're trying to develop. And so uh, that's the punchline. Uh, what I'm going to do is give you now a series of examples of several buildings that I think demonstrate this idea of how an architect and an engineer working very closely together and in fact uh, challenging one another to, to go beyond and do things a bit differently than the norm results in profound outcomes. Uh, and in fact, most of these things, when you reflect on them, are quite simple. Uh, they're not necessarily uh, busy or fussy. They're actually quite simple examples. So here you see a variety of pretty heroic buildings on the surface, but when you peel away the skin, uh, so to speak, and you look at the design of these buildings, they're actually quite simple. So I thought I'd start with a little bit of a historical perspective. Uh, I have the great fortune of working in a company that has had extraordinary forefathers uh, in the form of very profound engineers, those being John Skilling and Jack Christensen and Les Robertson, among many others. But uh, growing up in the culture of this company and having the ability to understand the stories and how those particular engineers worked in their careers has greatly influenced not only how I practice, but how all our colleagues in our company practice. This particular building in Seattle uh, is where our headquarters is located. Uh, Rainier Tower is the name of the building. And uh, it's a beautiful building. It was designed by uh, uh, Minoru Yamasaki, who was the architect. and. Uh, one of the things that's probably most striking, of course, is this pedestal base. And uh, while it's beautiful, there's actually a very specific reason that this was created. Uh, and the reason being that on this particular site, the amount of floor area that could be built was limited by the city zoning regulations. So they could only build essentially a 30-story building. And this particular site was uh, surrounded by buildings that were 10 stories tall and uh, like many cities around the world, Seattle is a city where views of the water command a premium in rent. And so the idea between uh, Yamasaki and John Skilling were to raise this whole building up in the air 10 floors uh, so that all the floors in the building could command a view of the water. 
And so then the question became, well, how best to do that and how to make that a beautiful piece of architecture and engineering as well. So this is the resultant of the, the base, but the, the impetus behind why it was done in the first place was the owner's brief to build a building that was an economic machine capable of generating revenue. The building diagram is quite simple. Uh, in fact, many people don't know this. They think that the building has this very big concrete core like we've been seeing in many of the buildings that uh, have been presented in this conference. In fact, this building has no concrete core. The, the pedestal, if you will, the base of the building is indeed concrete. But once you get above the 12th level, everything above the 12th level is a steel frame. There's no strong concrete core in this building. And so, in fact, the, the superstructure is very, very light. Uh, it's very flexible, it's very light. Uh, so if you can imagine this building, uh, it's much like a, a golf tee. So there's this strong uh, base that's embedded in the ground, and then this very light object that sits on top of it. Uh, the next building, just from a historical perspective to reflect on, uh, is the Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis. Again, a very profound bit of architecture, but driven by an owner's brief with regard to public space, and security. Again, this is a Federal Reserve Bank, so security was a concern and a premium, uh, but also they didn't want to uh, create a big wall in the city of Minneapolis. So Gunnar Burkertz were, was the architect, and together with uh, my forefathers, once again, came up with a very inventive uh, structural system and architecture that worked together here, in this case, taking inspiration from uh, uh, suspension bridges. So this building is built very much like a suspension bridge with, you see at the very top here, uh, this uh, compression strut truss. Uh, what most people don't realize about this building uh, was that when it was originally conceived and built, as you've seen here, uh, it was conceived to actually have the ability to expand the building vertically. And in fact, it was never completed this way, but in fact, the design initially was to create then ultimately an arch structure on top of the, the Cantonary Bridge to uh, complete the circle, so to speak. Anyway, so I'm going to fast forward now to not a tall building, but a, a good example of architecture and engineering coming together to address a client's uh, need or brief. This happens to be a theater project in Dallas, Texas, the Wiley Theater. The architect was a company in New York, or is a company in New York, called Rex. Uh, Rex, uh, Joshua, Prince Ramus, and Rem Coolhouse were partners for some time. Um, at any rate, the interesting thing about this very beautiful building is that the client's brief and the client's site was very challenging. You see here, kind of typically in a theater project, you have the main uh, theater hall, the back of the house, and the, the fly loft, if you will, the front of the house space, and then back of the house to create all the support space. This is how normally theaters are organized. In this particular case, there wasn't the site, uh, there wasn't the site area to allow for that horizontal organization of space. So, in rather, it needed to in fact be stacked. And so, this really drove the initial architectural ideas from the beginning. And, and diagrams such as this, where we're trying to stack the program above and below the main performance hall, really is was kind of key to the design ideas. Um, the other idea that the client had in his brief was that they didn't want just simply one type of theater. They wanted actually three theaters uh, or three separate configurations. So the question was how to create that also in this very confined space. So you can start to see in this diagram here that in fact some of the seating is here and here and also here in the basement and it all moves mechanically. So the entire building is not static but in fact very dynamic and the building with a push of the button can transform itself internally to create very different arrangements of seating. So back to the block diagrams, the question was how to create the structure for this uh, movable building, movable seating, multiple configurations. So what we needed to do was create a volume of space that was essentially column free, long span, uh, to keep everything out of the way so that as we transform the building internally, that there wasn't any structural constraint in the way. So it started with kind of the belt of the building, if you will, about halfway up the building, a very strong truss. Uh, some columns initially introduced at the corner. Uh, this is a simple structural diagram. It kind of made sense. The architect didn't like the corner columns, and so we started to push and shove and pull them back a bit. Uh, we then started talking about how to brace the building. 
uh, and creating frames out of these columns and ultimately thought, of course, if we tilt the columns, uh, the columns work better in axial uh, compression and tension than in bending. And kind of ultimately, the final geometry of the building looks something like this, creating both this kind of unique, interesting uh, structural arrangement, but achieving all the goals of the architecture. So this is what the building looked like under construction. Uh, it looks very similar, of course, to the model. And here you can see the seating and how the seating is starting to work and be integrated. And this is the result of that, that process. Uh, skipping across the ocean for a moment to Guangzhou, China. This building is, uh, I think, about 320 meters tall. Uh, it's one of the taller buildings in Guangzhou, not the tallest, but, uh, but it's uh, competing among the taller ones. Uh, and the client's brief here was that uh, this building was going to be occupied by a single tenant. It was not a multi-tenanted building. This building houses essentially the headquarters for the Trans uh, Department of Transportation in Guangdong province. And so the entire building was going to be occupied by a single tenant. And what they really didn't want to do was to have the typical outrigger floors that we normally see in many high-rise buildings. And so straight out of the, the shoot, straight in the beginning of the project, the client came to the architect, in this case was Helmut Jan, and asked that Helmut, together with his engineers ourselves, come up with a scheme that didn't devote any internal space to these vertical constraints of outriggers. And so the, the structural scheme that was conceived for this building uh, has its uh, roots, I suppose, in buildings like the Hancock Tower in Chicago uh, or other buildings that have kind of mega diagonal bracing on the outside. Now, in this case, the diagonal bracing by itself wasn't strong enough or stiff enough to deal with the seismic and wind loads in Guangzhou. And so we supplemented that, of course, with a strong concrete core. The, the uh, unique aspect of this building, I suppose, is that in plan, it's organized like this. You see the strong concrete core as normal. This is a typical floor framing scheme, so nothing too special. And then when you get to what I'm going to call a normal outrigger floor, which would be normally a mechanical floor or a refuge floor, this is what the floor looks like. You don't see large walls or large encumbrances of any sort on this floor. The only difference being is that the perimeter of the building, the diagonals, if we go back to uh, elevation here, you can see that, whoop, uh oh, there we go. The diagonals of this building back. There we go. The diagonals of this building attach to the corners every nine floors. And at this corner, this corner here, uh, at those floor diaphragms, the floor has been strengthened and stiffened so that the way the outriggering system works in this building is that the floor diaphragms actually create the couple between the, the interior core wall and the perimeter frame to uh, create the restoring forces on the building. And so the outriggers as vertical elements don't exist at all in this building. It's nearly completed. The skin has recently been uh, topped off. Uh, it's not quite occupied yet, but uh, it will be in a few months' time. I'm um, going to move back to Chicago uh, and the Aqua Tower. I think many of you have seen this. It's been highly publicized the last year or so. Uh, this building, while incredibly beautiful and very striking on the Chicago skyline, very unique for sure, uh, was designed by an architect named Jeannie Gang, who is, uh, at least in North America, one of the rising stars of young architects. Uh, the structural diagram for this building is very, very simple. Uh, it's a core wall and some wing walls, uh, a mild steel flat slab. Uh, it's very, very simple. And in fact, if you were to carve away the perimeter balcony conditions, uh, the building's a rectangle. Uh, and it would actually be very boring. So the trick to this whole building was to work with Jeannie and try and have her understand what a diagram like this means to an engineer uh, and have an engineer understand what a diagram like this that the architect draws means to her. Uh, this is a, a view looking down from the sky and showing you the slab edge on every floor in this building. And every floor from the bottom to the top has a different configuration of slab edge. The question really was not so much how do we analyze that, but really twofold. One is how far can we push this idea, meaning how long can these cantilevers really be? And then secondly, how do we really build this and build it in an efficient and effective way? Uh, so starting with how do we build it part, there were really two keys to 
extending these cantilevers, uh, and some of the cantilevers are upwards of three and a half to four meters. So they're quite, quite uh, aggressive in their, in their uh, dimension. Uh, one of the keys that we recognized early on in concrete construction is that probably the single heaviest floor loading that the structure will see is during the construction of the building itself due to the formwork, due to the temporary weight of drywall stacked or blockwork stacked or what have you on the floor. And so noting that this temporary construction load is very heavy and it's also applied at a very young age of the concrete when the concrete is still green results in cracking of the concrete. And this results in slab deflections. And so the question was, how do we manage that process? And the result was to require that the contractor, in this case, use not only a flying form system, but one you can see here where the, the flying forms themselves are column hung. There is no reshoring. None of the wet concrete load ever touches the slab below. And in relieving the structure of that loading condition, allowed the slabs to cure longer allowed them to not crack under this heavy load, and thus we could push the, the cantilevers quite a bit further. The second bit about how we built this was how do you create this undulating slab edge in an efficient way? And the, the idea there was to use a metal edge form, but the trick was to, to find a support system that would retain the wet weight of the concrete, but yet at the same time be flexible enough to curve to the unique form on every floor, and then once it was stripped, to not have bent it so much that it would yield, but in fact spring back to its original position. So we experimented a lot with the gauge of the metal, with the support conditions on how that metal was supported, and ultimately came up with a design here after uh, probably 20 mock-ups with the contractor in a warehouse in suburban Chicago. So and here you can see the result, of course. Uh, if you've been to Chicago, uh, you know how striking this building is and how unique it is on the skyline. I'm uh, moving to a pretty heroic building in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, the original brief for this building was one where the client had three specific sites. Uh, one that was on the main street of Louisville here, and then two others along the main river in town. And the client wanted to create this very large mixed use project, but he wanted his front door to be on Main Street, but the lion's share of the area to support the project was back here on the river. So the architect came up with some interesting diagrams initially to try and conceive how these programs, uh, the programmatic use would be stacked, uh, how the building would be integrated. Uh, and these were the original diagrams that the architect gave us. Uh, once again, this was Joshua Prince Ramus from Rex. Um, we came up with some original structural diagrams. The, the inspiration being that of a bar stool, a three-legged bar stool. So you can think of three legs making a very stable tripod and then the seat itself being a stable platform for someone sitting on it. This was the analogy for the building, that there was this bar seat, or ultimately we called it the island, about halfway up the building, sitting on legs that then the buildings above rested. So these were the early diagrams of this building. Uh, this is my partner, Jay, uh, being rather astonished when the architect rolled out the first uh, models of this building and we were trying to figure out how to make it stand up. Uh, that was my reaction to the same. Uh, a bit perplexed, I suppose. Uh, ultimately, we did come back to something that was a bit more pragmatic, which was to take the same ideas, but rather than trying to slope everything and have everything lean against one another, to create something that was a bit more orthogonal, a bit more vertical but yet still trying to create the, the same effect uh, overall. So then the next question was, how do you build this? And the idea of how we would build it would be to create these concrete cores down low, start uh, jump forming them with the concrete jump form, build, in fact, a bunch of the steel framing for the bar stool seat or the island on the ground, continue on with the cores, and then ultimately jack into the sky this island or the bar stool, if you will. Uh, and the dimensions of this were about 20 meters tall and about 80 meters in plan on either side. So it was quite a, a large piece of construction. Once that was in, in place, each of these cores bracing off of one another, the building could continue construction both below and above at the same time. And so the overall construction schedule was, was quite fast. Uh, the building had started construction, but then due to the 
economic conditions in the U.S., things have stopped for a bit while the owner tries to repackage his financing. Uh, moving quickly to Chicago, uh, this is an interesting building. Uh, this is 111 South Wacker. Getch Partners was the architect. Uh, interestingly, this building, like you heard the stories about uh, Burj Khalifa uh, the other day in terms of the design timeline for that, this building was designed in 2000 and 2001, and we started here, and the building started to morph in its design and get taller and taller and taller, and right there is September 11, 2001. And the building basically stopped, uh, design stopped, and we retooled the overall design of the building going forth after 9-11, where some of these kind of her heroic tree structures that we were contemplating early on uh, got set aside in favor of, of a, a bit more uh, quiet design and a bit less heroic design. Here it is in its completed state. Uh, the big trick here was to create this open public plaza area that both the developer, who was the John Buck Company, and the mayor of Chicago, then Mayor Daley, were quite intrigued by. Uh, so to do that structurally, uh, we used a series of, of these V columns, or we called them the champagne flutes, but coming down to these single large diameter columns, and then all these intermediate floors in here were hung, so this beam spanned to this column, the load traveled up to the top here and then back down to the base. Uh, some floor bracing to create some stability, but this is how it was built. Uh, again, building these things sometimes is more challenging than actually designing them. Uh, and so what was done here, you can see the V column going up. This column is actually ultimately in tension as a hanger, but temporarily, temporarily there are these diagonal columns installed to uh, allow the contractor to proceed in a uh, normal fashion from the bottom to the top. And you can see here on the one fateful Saturday morning when the column was removed here, of course, the day that the, so this is all now completed and it's time to remove this column and the day that the contractor removed that column, of course, they made me stand right there. Uh, the lobby was uh, quite beautiful uh, and so in, we'll kind of move along here. Uh, the last project that I'll mention here just briefly, uh, again, is a project with Helmut Jan that Turner Construction is building in Doha uh, in Qatar. And, uh, this building is uh, uh, quite a large building. Um, it's uh, tended to be 550 meters when completed. The convention center itself down here uh, is under construction. This photo is a little, dis, uh, little uh, deceiving in the sense that this building, 550 meters, if you were to lay the building down on its side, it actually fits inside the convention center. So the convention center is quite huge as well. Uh, and it's well on its way. It's uh, probably 75% completed. Uh, but working with Helmut and uh, again the client's brief here, uh, well you can see here the height of this building compared to the Burj Khalifa uh, and the Mori building in Shanghai. This is uh, up there. Uh, obviously the slide's a little bit dated in the sense that uh, there's several more buildings that probably should be included here, but uh, nonetheless uh, it's quite a tall building. The structure itself is very simply organized, uh, strong core like most of the buildings we're talking about. In this case, uh, outriggers, one, two, three, four sets of outriggers that go to mega columns at the corners. Uh, and then in this particular building, it's a little difficult to see. I think the next slide will show it better. Perhaps I'll move, go there. What happens is this is a series of, build a series of 30 story buildings, wherein the load from these kind of intermediate columns comes down and then is transferred on a chevron here to shed all of that gravity load out to the perimeter mega columns. Oops. So if I go back here real briefly, you can see that that chevron is included here. One, two, three. So at each of the outrigger floors, as we're reaching out to grab the mega columns to brace the building, we're also shedding all of the gravity load to those mega columns in order to uh, have the, the self-weight of the building help resist some of the wind loading. And this really was a, a, a series of uh, very uh, intense design workshops with, with Helmut Jan, who was the architect for this. Uh, at any rate, that's uh, some examples of some buildings that I think demonstrate this notion of how an architect and an engineer working together uh, in a very tight-knit collaborative sense can come up with some buildings that are, are pretty spectacular and actually, at the end of the day, fairly simple to realize. Thank you very much.
Thank you for the interesting presentation about the harmony between the architect and the structure. And right now, uh, we open the floor for any question to Mr. Rod. So, if anyone have a question. No question? <laughs> okay.